you have your Bibles today, would you join me, please, in the book of Jeremiah? The book of Jeremiah. You found the book of Jeremiah, if you will, turn to the 39th chapter. And while you're turning, let me welcome you again today. Thank you for being in the Berean Baptist Church. We're always delighted to look out across the auditorium and see you. And uh, we're just thrilled that you're in the Lord's house today. And uh, thank you for coming to be a part of our service. Good to have the Midkiffs back with us. We appreciate these folks so good, so much. Good to see you folks today and others who are visiting. God bless you for being in your place. I'm going to read one verse of Scripture today from the book of Jeremiah for time constraint. And it's found in the 39th chapter, verse number 16. Jeremiah, as he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, Go and speak to Abed Malik, the Ethiopian, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring my words upon this city for evil and not for good, and they shall be accomplished in the day before thee, in that day before thee. I want to call your attention in this verse to a little phrase, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Here's what I want you to note. Here's what I'm going to, I'm going to speak to us about for just a few minutes. Behold, I will bring my words upon this city for evil. I want to speak to us for just a moment. Probably won't get finished, but I want to begin on this subject. God meant what he said. And notice the phrase again, Behold, I will bring my words upon this city for evil. God meant what he said. Lord, I want to thank you that we have lived to experience and to worship on another Lord's Day. And Lord, the few minutes that we have together, I want them to count for you. And the only way that's possible is if he, the Holy Spirit of God, speaks to the speaker and those spoken to. So I ask you in the name of the Lord Jesus to help us during these few fleeting moments. May we be challenged. May we look into the confines, the content of your word and make the application for a better Christian life. And should there be those unsaved, I know you'll speak to them. And I pray, Lord, that you'll just remove anything and everything out from in front of them, around them, within them, <clears throat> that would hinder the Word of God from doing its work in their lives. I ask you now to help us. Help us now and during the invitation. And we'll thank you for it because we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you. You can say about the book of Jeremiah beginning with the first chapter and going all the way to the last chapter. Judgment is coming. Jeremiah was called from his mother's womb, chapter 1, to be a prophet to Israel. And as you read the book of Jeremiah, you will notice every chapter basically builds upon another chapter. And each chapter is a chapter that sits before the nation, coming judgment. Judgment coming, inevitable judgment coming. 
And the bottom line, why the, ju why the judgment is coming is because they have rejected God. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. He wept over his nation. The book following the book of Jeremiah, the Lamentations, a funeral dirge. A funeral dirge where he sits in the streets of Jerusalem after the city has been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar's army. And he weeps. And he looks at a few strangling people in the city and he says, is it nothing to you? All ye that pass by, is it nothing to you that God has had to judge this city? There's a passage of Scripture in the second chapter of the book of Jeremiah that defines what brought this judgment upon the city. And let me read it to you. And then let me explain it to you because this is America. Jeremiah writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And Jeremiah 2.13 says, For my people, God's people, have committed two evils. First of all, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. And they have hewn them out cisterns, broken cisterns, which can hold no water. Let me illustrate what Jeremiah is saying. It is as if there's a place somewhere out in a desert and there's a scarcity of water. And these individuals des decide to search for some water and eventually they find a bubbling spring out in the middle of nowhere. And they say to themselves, this spring is so beneficial, quenches the thirst so successfully, we're going to build a house around this spring because we believe this spring can satisfy our thirst. And so they begin to live there. But after a short period of time, they say something like this, we're tired of the spring. We're tired of the water. We're going to build our own cisterns. So they leave their home. They leave the bubbly spring, which is providing for them an ample supply of water. And they go off in another part of the desert, and they build them a cistern. And the purpose of that is to catch the rainwater. But when they build the cistern, they do not fix the cistern to where it's waterproof. And when the rain finally comes and runs into this handmade cistern, the water runs out of it as fast as it came into it. God is saying through Jeremiah, you have forsaken me the fountains of living water. Now, what he was saying was this. He's making a, a comparison. God is the one who could have and desired to solve all of their problems, to watch over them against all of the surrounding enemy nations. God himself was their protector. But in the book of Jeremiah, we see the nation of Israel going into idolatry. They have forsaken the fountain of living water. But as they go into idolatry and as they turn their back upon the Lord, they run off to enemy nations for support. They look to Egypt. You find this all through the book of Jeremiah. They say, we don't need God. We have Egypt. We have other nations in the world we can turn to. They will help us in the time of military assault. They will be our fountains of living water. So God rebukes them. 
God says you're trusting cisterns, broken cisterns, which can hold no water, which in the day of adversity, in the day of trouble, cannot assist you and cannot minister to you. That's the story of Jeremiah. Some 52 chapters, God is saying to them, you've left the fountain of living water. God is saying to them, you have built yourselves these cisterns. You have looked to other gods. You have looked to other nations. And you're blindsided as to my leadership and my presence upon your lives. As we look at the book of Jeremiah, we realize that in our text verse, the city of Jerusalem is being destroyed. And it is being destroyed because, as I've just pointed out to us, they have forsaken God. But what's happened to them, hear me well, what's happened to them was prophesied that it would happen unless they repented. At least three times in the book of Jeremiah, God said to the nation of Israel and more exclusively to the city of Jerusalem that if you do not repent, I will send you out of your city into Babylon, a near, nearly a two-month journey by foot where you will be held captive for 70 years unless you repent. Listen to what the Scriptures teach us. In Jeremiah chapter 25, in verse number 11, and this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. Listen again to Jeremiah 29, 10, for thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. So God is saying because you have hewn out these leaky cisterns and you've turned to the other nations of the world and you have turned your back against me, I'm going to destroy the city. Jeremiah comes on the scene to say to the city of Jerusalem and to the nation of Israel, the city does not have to be destroyed. Jeremiah is on the scene saying, if you will repent, if you put away the idolatry in your life, if you will return to the fountain of life, if you will return to your God, he will not have to judge you. But they kept serving false gods. They kept looking to Egypt. They kept looking to other cities. And as a result, God brought judgment upon Jerusalem. If you'll notice, and let me encourage you to keep your Bibles open. I want you to see it. If you'll notice in our text chapter, verse number one, please look with me for just a few minutes. I want to point this out. If you'll notice in verse number one that in the ninth year, now that's important that you see this, in the ninth year of Zedekiah, who was king of the southern kingdom of Judah, in the tenth month came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all of his army against Jerusalem, and they besieged it. Now watch this. This is vitally important. I want you to watch something in verse number one. In the ninth year, what happened? Precisely and exactly what Jeremiah said would happen. God is saying, I told you so. God is saying, if you do not repent, I mean what I say. I will bring judgment upon this city. God is saying to the nation of Israel, again, more explicitly, exclusively to the city of Jerusalem, this city is going to be destroyed if you do not return to me, God is saying. 
So in the ninth year, because they're still building broken cisterns, in the ninth year, here comes Nebuchadnezzar. He surrounds the city of Jerusalem. And he has thousands of soldiers out in the field and the fields around the city of Jerusalem. Notice the word in verse number one, he besieged it. Notice this, please. He besieged it. That's a word that literally means Nebuchadnezzar and his army completely surrounded. They besieged. They completely surrounded the city of Jerusalem. But I want you to notice in verse number two how long this took place. Because in verse number two, it says, and in the 11th year, verse one, the ninth year, in the 11th year, the Bible says of Zedekiah in the fourth month, in the ninth day of the month, the city was broken up. Now, please put this in your mind and think about this just a minute. Nebuchadnezzar and his army surrounded the city of Jerusalem for two years. Verse 1, the ninth year they came and surrounded it. Verse number 2, two years later they destroyed the city. For two years they cut off all supplies coming into the city. For two years they are enclosed within the walls of the city. That's the reason the Bible says in the book of Jeremiah, the summer is ended, the harvest is ended, and we are not saved. Why? Why did they say the harvest is ended and we are not saved? Simply because they had planted their crops out in the fields outside the walls of Jerusalem, and Nebuchadnezzar came, and they trampled over the crops. But beyond that, the people inside the walls of the city could not get out into the field and, and harvest the crops. So on the inside of the walls of Jerusalem, they're held captive. Sure, for two years they're safe inside the walls, but they can't get out of the walls. If they get out of the walls, they will be killed instantly. But because they can't get out, they cannot get out to get their crops. That's the reason he said the summer is ended. And the harvest is past. And we're not saved. The word being saved means we're not being saved. We have not been saved. Saved to get food. Saved to bring our crops. Saved to bring our harvest inside of the walls. And during these two years, starvation engulfed the inside of the city of Jerusalem. It engulfed the inside of the city of Jerusalem until the most barbaric thing you could ever imagine began to take place. They literally, out of starvation, cooked and ate their own children. It's in the book of Jeremiah. That, my friend, is what took place because they turned their back upon God. They forsook the one who brought them safely from Egypt across the Red Sea, across the Jordan, into the promised land. They said, we don't need you. You brought us out. We don't need you any longer. Is that not a picture of America? This nation started these many years ago because they asked God to give them safety as they crossed the huge ocean. And they started out on their knees. You find this throughout history. They disembarked from their boats. They got on the shores of this country. The first thing they did, they bowed their knees and the sands the shores of the mighty ocean, and they said, God, thank you for bringing us over. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us over safely. Historians tell us that usually when these ships made their way from other parts of the world, especially England to America, because they were in such close quarters and these little small ships like the Mayflower, 
it was not uncommon for 50% of the people to die on the way over. Somebody would get sick, somebody contacted a disease, they'd spread it, they'd bury them at sea. And yet when the Mayflower came over, they only lost one person, and that was a person who was against them, and he got sick and died, and they left him in the sea. God protected them. And when they got here, they had the divine protection of God. We're here today because behind us, God has blessed America, as the songwriter said, God bless America. We're enjoying the freedoms that we hold dear today because God has blessed this nation. But Israel had also been blessed. There's never been a nation that has experienced the miracles of God like Israel. 400 years of bondage down in Egypt, delivered by the Passover. The Red Sea opens up. They walk across on dry ground. They go to Kadesh Barnea. They send out 12 spies representing the 12 tribes. They come back. They've got a pole across their shoulder, and they've got one cluster of, vine, of grapes. on that. That's how, big, that's how large the grapes grew to over in Canaan. One cluster on a pole between two people. Preacher said years ago, you could cut one of the grapes open and use the skin for a shower cap. <laughs> they go to Kadesh Barnea. They look over. They bring the rewards back. And yet 10 of the 12 says, our God's not big enough to take us over. God said, I'm big enough to put you back in the desert. And for 40 years, he sent them back till that generation died with the exception of Joshua and Caleb. And he raised up a new generation. And that generation crossed the Jordan and it miraculously opened up and God brought them through on dry ground. And God fought their battles. He said, I'll give you vineyards that you never planted. I'll give you houses that you never built it. I'll give you cities that you never built it. The enemy had built them and God allowed them to take possession of vineyards and homes and cities. God bless them. God has so blessed America. And I stand in this pulpit today almost in tears because America has done precisely and exactly what Israel did. We have become self-sufficient. We have said, Lord, we don't need you anymore. We use our ingenuity. We pass our laws. But our laws are not godly laws. Our laws are not scriptural laws. The killing of the unborn is not godly. Operating on little boys and girls and trying to make boys and girl, boys, girls and girls, boys, that's not godly. That's ungodly. And just because we have become the greatest military power in the world, listen to me closely, does not mean that we can retain that status. Because the mighty Rome at one time said, we're the greatest military power in the world. They had more soldiers. They had more ships. They had more chariots. They had more armament. They had more gunpowder. They had more bullets than any nation in the world. And they said, look at our beautiful tree-laden streets. Look at our military power. Look how great we are. We control the world. But God said you cannot control yourselves. Edward Gibbons, who wrote The Rise and the Fall of the Roman Empire, listed about five major reasons why Rome fell. And one reason he said Rome fell was that they were trying to fight military victories from without and they decayed from within. Amen. Given said one reason why that nation failed was because it became a sports crazed nation. He said that nation rejected God and God brought that nation to its knees. There's a good possibility God is in right now, God is right now in the throes of bringing America to its knees. I don't want it to happen. I pray that it won't happen. 
But my friend, this nation has turned its back on God and thumbed its nose at God. God is a long-suffering God. He will allow it to happen for a period of time, but not indefinitely. And we're getting close right now. I'm convinced as I look at our nation, as I look at the nation of Israel, as I look at my Bible, I think we're getting close right now to exhausting the long-suffering patience of an omnipotent God. Amen. Notice, if you will, in verse number 3 of chapter 39, that the princesses of the king of Babylon came in and sat in the middle gate. Now, that's what a conquering king or a conquering general would do when they destroyed a city. When they captured a city, they came to the gate of the city after they'd captured the city and they sat in the gate of the city. It was a token of the fact we have destroyed you. It was a token of the fact we have captured you. It was a token of the fact we will spoil you. We will take your goodies from you. And after two years of surrounding the nation, uh, the city of Jerusalem, I want you to notice the price that they had to pay. Watch this closely in your Bibles. I'm going a little slower today. I want you to see this. I want you to notice in your Bible that after two years, in verse number eight of chapter 39, the first thing they did, the, Chalde the Chaldeans burn the king's house. Here's a place of glory for them. Here's a place where the king lived. They determined that they would bring destruction to it. Look in the same verse. They burned the homes of the people. Look in the same verse. The Bible says that they break down the walls of Jerusalem. We have a picture of this in Lamentations chapter number 1. And I made note of this a few minutes ago. Jeremiah is sitting in the streets of the city. Now get the picture. Smoke is ascending upward towards the sky. 360 degrees. The house of God has been ransacked. The house of God, the glorious temple has been destroyed. It's on fire. The place where the king lived is destroyed. It's on fire. As you look up and down the streets of Jerusalem, every house in the city of Jerusalem is ablaze and the smoke is ascending upward. And there's a few little stragglers left on the street. And here sits weeping Jeremiah in the streets of the city of Jerusalem. And he looks around and he said, is it nothing to you, all ye that pass by? Is it nothing to you? Does, not, does it not mean anything to you that God has had to judge this city in such a devastating way? Does it not mean anything to you that God has judged us because we have rejected him, we have turned against him? Is it nothing to you that all that we possess has been removed, has been taken from us because of our rejection of our God? But not only that, same chapter I want you to notice in verse number 9. The people were deported. Then Nebuchadnezzar and the captain of the guard carried away captive into Babylon, the remnant of the people. It remained in the city. And those that fell away and that fell to him were the rest of the people that remained. Literally thousands of people in that city died. The Bible talks about there were so many bodies in the streets that if you walked in the streets, you stumbled over bodies. And then they marched these people out of the city and across the countryside all of the way to Babylon. And it would take a minimum of a month and a half to get from Jerusalem 
to Babylon. Could you imagine walking that distance for a month and a half to get to the city of Babylon solely because they had rejected their God? The Bible talks about many of those people, they took fishing hooks and they hooked a fishing hook in, a, in the lip of an individual and they hooked it to an individual in front of them and with fishing hooks in their lips holding them together in lines, they walked out across the countryside. But I want you to see something in closing. Zedekiah the king was warned that this was coming and Zedekiah the king turned his back on God. He had ample time to repent. He had ample time to turn the nation back to God. And instead of turning the nation back to God, when Nebuchadnezzar, and I'll talk more about this later, when Nebuchadnezzar came to the city to destroy it, he tried to escape. He went out with some of his closest associates. He went out through a side wall in the city. He thought he had escaped. And our nation today thinks it's, it's escaping. And individuals in our land, they think they're escaping. We're doing pretty good. We've still got food in the refrigerator. We've got food in the cupboard. We've got a nice automobile. We've got clothes in the closet. We've got a roof over our head. Yes, but we have forsaken the one who gave us those beneficial items. And Zedekiah said, I'm, gonna, I'm going to escape. But you cannot escape the judgment of God. If God determines he will rain judgment upon an individual or upon a nation, no one can stand in the face of God and say, I decry that God is the ultimate victor. God is the ultimate winner. And Zedekiah the king was warned by Jeremiah, if you repent and cause the nation to repent, God will withhold his judgment. Instead of repenting, he tried to escape the judgment. But no one's going to do that. Not a single person listening to me today will ultimately escape the judgment of God. Amen. All of us, somewhere, sometime out there in the near future, have an appointment with our Creator. Amen. He has appointed a day, the Bible said, in which He will judge the world in righteousness by His Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We may put it off. We may try to evade it. We may try to get it out of our mind. We may try to say, well, it's a long ways off. It could be today. Amen. God will judge His people. And let me tell you this in closing. The judgment is going to be worse than the average person realizes. I want to show you what happened to Zedekiah. We're going to have the invitation. I don't have time to enlarge on it, but I want you to look in chapter 39. They captured the king Zedekiah and his boys and his close associates and took them out in the desert place where Nebuchadnezzar had set up his headquarters. And in verse number 6, then the king of Babylon slew the sons of Zedekiah in Riblah before his eyes. Also the king of Babylon slew all the nobles of Judah. Notice what happened. Zedekiah's sons, heirs to the throne, are captured along with Zedekiah, and they go out into the camp of Nebuchadnezzar. And while King Zedekiah is looking on, they kill his own sons in his presence. And they kill the nobles, they kill the rulers that ruled with Zedekiah. Kill them. My friend, this could have been, this, was, this could have been prevented from happening. But they would not turn to God. The judgment is worse than Zedekiah believed it to be because, listen closely, the, the last thing Zedekiah experienced, the last thing Zedekiah was able to see with his eyes was the destruction of his boys. Now it gets worse from here on out. Look at the next verse. Moreover, he put out Zedekiah's eyes and bound him with chains to carry him to Babylon. The last thing Zedekiah looked upon, was able to see, was Nebuchadnezzar and his army killing his own sons. And as quick as they killed the sons 
of Zedekiah the king, they took the eyesight of King Zedekiah. They put his eyes out. The last thing he was able to see was the death of his sons. And now he's going to have to walk for a month and a half all of the way to Babylon. He's going to be judged. He's already been judged because the judgment was worse than he anticipated. He thought he could, thought he could go out a side wall of the city of Jerusalem and escape, but he did not escape. And there's no one, no one anywhere at any time who will escape their appointment, it is appointed unto men once to die, and after that the judgment. Everybody in this building, and listen to me beyond these walls, we have an appointment. We may, we may go to the doctor, and we may schedule an appointment, and we may not be able to keep the appointment. Uh, you may have an attorney, and you may uh, say to the attorney, I need an appointment. I have some legal uh, trouble I need to discuss with you. But my friend, you may cancel that appointment. But let me tell you today, everybody listening to me has a divine appointment on the divine calendar of heaven where one day we as Christians will stand before him at the beam of the judgment seat of Jesus Christ or every lost person who's never trusted Christ as their personal Savior. You have an appointment with your Creator. You have an appointment with the God of the universe. You have an appointment with the judge of the universe. And on that day, all of God's creation will ultimately stand in his presence without an excuse. And we will be judged. And if if you're lost, listen to me. Judgment still comes for lost people. There is still a hell in this Bible. You don't hear about it much today. You hear about it out in public when people tell you to go there. But our pulpits have become silent. But there's still a hell. And we're going to have to face God. That ought to concern us. That should concern us that we have an appointment with our Creator. God judged Jerusalem. God judged the king because they turned their back on him. Listen to me as we stand together for our invitation. Listen to me closely. Don't turn your back. Don't turn your back on the greatest friend you have in the universe. That little song that kids sang years ago is still true. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Amen. He loves you. Amen. But don't you take the love of Christ and stick your fingers in the eyes of Jesus Christ. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. We're singing right now. If you need to come to this altar, come on.